So welcome to uh, weeks 11 and 12. Um, looks like most of you have uh, gotten uh, some kind of a head start with uh, sentiment analysis. <clears throat> so these two weeks we are going to be focused on doing sentiment analysis, but uh, the two weeks are also just as much about getting to know the DB2 warehouse um, uh, on uh, IBM Cloud and being able to y use analytic tools directly on the uh, DB2 database. So there's just there are going to be lots of moving parts, of course, uh, in the uh, tutorial and also in the assignment uh, that is coming up next week. So first, you should be able to create. Uh, your own version or instance of DB2 on um, uh, the cloud warehouse, and then load data uh, into tables, uh, explore the tables, uh, connect our studio to your table or to your schema, and then uh, use uh, the statistical functions in R uh, to analyze those data. Um, and the analysis you are going to do is uh, going to uh, focus on extracting uh, the statistics related to different sentiments expressed in the uh, Twitter um, data that you are loading into the uh, DB2 tables. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I know that it's going to be. I, I think Elena said uh, you know some. Students in the past felt that this is the toughest assignment um, uh, in the whole course. So uh, what we will do is um, I will quickly walk through uh, the theory theory behind sentiment analysis, look at certain, some algorithms for sentiment analysis, and then um, Elena will walk us through the tutorial. Okay, so I hope to uh, reserve uh, more time for the tutorial walkthrough. Okay, all right. So uh, here are here is the definition of sentiment analysis that I like. Uh, it says that sentiment analysis or opinion mining is the uh, computational study of three things, uh, specifically opinion. Attitudes and emotions expressed in a text or document. Okay, so opinions can include judgments and subjective evaluations, um, etc. Okay, attitude is the is 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 almost the settled way of thinking, the viewpoint of the person. Okay, people come with different attitudes uh, to the uh, table. Um, what they perceive are uh, influenced by their attitude. Okay, so th that is uh, a very that is specifically different from opinions. And finally, you have emotions. These are the emotional states um, under which the person was when he or she typed up a text message or a Twitter message. Uh, th and you know things like that. So, um, if you if you look at you know what kind of information is going to be useful uh, to a business or to any uh, consumer, um, you know those those sentiments generally fall into these three categories. You know people who express opinions uh, about products. They express opinions about, uh, you know, policies, uh, political candidates, um, etc. And uh, those opinions are also heavily influenced by their own attitudes. And um, <clears throat> when somebody is evaluating a particular uh, product or, you know, rating a movie. Um, the emotional state of the person also influences the uh, rating or the, the scores that they give to the products and the uh, uh, movies. Okay, so all these three are distinct 
sentiments, distinct classes of sentiments that we are generally interested in. And um, the main goal is to, you know, determine the polarity of each sentiment. So what we mean by that is, is does this text express a positive or a negative opinion is what we want to know, okay? Sometimes the intensity of the polarity is also useful, but that involves a lot more uh, computation and a lot more analysis, okay? So generally what we are interested in are the polarity of the uh, sentiments. So that includes the emotions, attitudes, opinions. So you could have positive or negative emotions. So those could be, you know, just broadly speaking, positive emotions or happy, negative emotions or, you know, anger, anger sadness, um, and things like that, okay? And also, um, in most uh, analysis, um, and in most data science work related to sentiment analysis, we try to avoid the neutral category so that we can get more, uh, you know, more precise results, more selective results. So the polarity usually, you know, uh, if, if the uh, sample data has a lot of neutral emotions or neutral attitudes, uh, it's good to initially screen them out if you can. Okay, so that, that improves your uh, classification accuracy, and we will see why later on, because, um, you know, sentiment analysis is probably one of the most, uh, most difficult uh, classification or estimation tasks uh, that we will ever encounter, and therefore, you know, we try to simplify the problem itself as much as possible. Okay. Uh, so, what are the diff what are the different types of sentiments that a data scientist should be interested in? Um, and I just listed three, you know, opinions, attitudes, and emotions. But there are other uh, viewpoints out there. I guess I can say there are other opinions out there. So, for example, uh, in this book, speech and language processing. Uh, the authors um, rely on a psychological model of emotion uh, proposed by Scherer, um, and it's also you know it's also tightly related to the sentiment analysis that you will see on the Stanford NLP website. Um, they look at five broad categories of uh, sentiments. Okay, so you can see them listed here: emotions, mood interpersonal stance, attitude, and personality traits, okay? Um, you can see that there is some overlap between uh, the list I have on the left side and this list, but um, some are, uh, you know, uh, I feel that some of the categories uh, in the broader list uh, on the right side are, um, not very conducive to uh, statistical analysis. So for example, mood uh, could be related to uh, emotions, but they are trying to distinguish between a person being sad and a person being depressed. And I don't think the tools we have now are sophisticated enough to make those distinctions. Okay, so I mean, you will you will see a lot of uh, um, you know you will see this this also being talked about and uh, used a lot in sentiment analysis. But uh, so I want you to be aware of the uh, problems with directly taking a list of psychological uh, traits and applying them to sentiment analysis. So otherwise, uh, again, there is, uh, you know, a category here called uh, personality trait, uh, you know, and they list, uh, you know, nervousness, anx anxiety, and things like that. I have no idea how you can, you know, use statistical models or, um, or NLP 
to arrive at those uh, you know, to 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 identify those personality traits okay i just think it's not uh, feasible okay so uh, we will stick to the list of three sentiments listed on the uh, uh, left side okay so that's uh, the types of sentiment that we will be dealing with and what are the challenges in sentiment identification uh, <clears throat> there are many many challenges and most of them are related to how we use language okay uh, human beings are very very creative with language and that is a problem for uh, nlp in general but more specifically um, it's a bigger problem for sentiment analysis okay so the the uh, language structures that uh, pose major challenges to sentiment identification are uh, listed here okay i listed some um on the top like metaphors idioms sarcasm irony and things like that i don't think similes are uh, much of a problem but uh, it's simply because i haven't been able to find an example where uh, you can express a contradictory emotion uh, with a particular word okay um so let's go over some examples so you can start with a simple question like how was your day and you know you can get a reply a response great and that is clearly a positive sentiment good is also a positive sentiment but not as positive as great so you you can see a, a level of intensity there uh, you could say okay which is neutral bad terrible you know those are more negative sentiments and then we encounter a whole bunch of situations that are going to be very difficult to deal with in statistical models for example if you are if you have lots of examples in your data that have the word bad and those examples are associated or labeled as negative sentiment then your classifier or your model is going to learn that strong association and then when it encounters uh, a text like not bad which is going to happen much more in infrequently than the word bad itself then it's going to be confused so in this uh, situation it is probably going to classify not bad as a negative sentiment okay unless you take negations specifically into account in your pipeline okay you at some point you have to say okay these are the uh, you know these are the uh, words or the entities uh, i am trying to extract but i also want to associate um you know negations um with uh, the corresponding sentiments and then you use the whole bag of words or whole bag of whole list uh, to train your model okay so in that case not bad will become synonymous with good and we will look at will look at some examples of how that can be done um, in classifiers okay so do you understand uh, the issues now uh, somebody could say something like peachy that is you know obviously a very creative way of saying uh, good and there are going to be very and and those those types of occurrence uh, words or phrases are going to be very infrequent not everybody says peachy when you ask them how was your day right and then you come in you you get into um, things like sarcastic comments you know somebody could say oh it was so awesome or something like that <laughs> and they mean the exact opposite of it right and um, that brings us to the other two examples you could use the same um, adjective and sometimes even the same adverb to uh, 
to flip the meaning of a sentence. So, for example, you can say, the pain in my back was excruciating, and that is a strong negative, uh, you know, sentiment. On the other hand, you could say the process is painful but not excruciating, and that should be treated as a somewhat positive sentiment, okay? And then you get into uh, all these idioms and, um, you know, colloquial uh, terms like not the sharpest tool in the shed. Uh, how do you get your uh, classifier uh, to recognize that that is a negative sentiment expressed towards a person? Okay, so if you go back here, you know, you got interpersonal stance or attitudes or even an opinion, opinion of a person. So this is, we have, we have, you know, when you have an opinion classifier and somebody says, not the sharpest tool in this shed, which is probably not going to occur too frequently compared to phrases like he's just dumb or, some, you know, something like that. Um, so the classifier is not going to pick up the true sentiment behind uh, this sentence, okay, uh, which expresses a negative sentiment towards a person. Okay, so I have more examples here, you know, empty suit and things like that. And then you got oxymorons like good grief. Now, you know, if you're, uh, if you're uh, uh, clustering algorithm has only encountered good and grief separately, the first time it encounters good grief, it's going to be confused. Um, so, you know, same thing with soft rock and things like that. Okay, so these are the challenges to sentiment analysis. Of course, there are challenges to NLP in general, but more so uh, for sentiment analysis. <clears throat> and I have a, an example at the bottom. Okay, um, it says, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. This is a sentence that was coined by uh, Chomsky. It is, a per it is a perfectly grammatical sentence with absolutely no meaning. You know, it's a meaningless sentence. So you could have, uh, so th there is this difference between uh, being grammatically correct and making the semantic sense, okay? And um, psychologists and linguists generally think that these are two different systems, that you have a system in the brain that deals with universal grammar, Okay, so you are able to generate uh, grammatically correct sentences, but they don't need to have meaning. Okay, now when we when we use statistical analysis to identify sentiments or to classify texts according to their uh, sentiment polarity, we are almost thoroughly ignoring grammatical correctness, okay? Uh, the statistical models are going to look only at specific words that are, infor or phrases that are informa informative for the classification task, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, even uh, the phrases we use, like uh, bag of words, okay, or uh, word to uh, vec, they already tell you that we are ignoring the sentence structure. We are treating a sentence as if it is a bag of words, okay, with no particular order um, or, you know, recurring structures and things like that. So, uh, so you have to uh, be aware of the fact that in most of what we do, in sentiment analysis, uh, any classifier you build or any uh, identification model you build uh, is, you know, it almost always ignores grammatical uh, structure and it focuses solely on um, extracting the meaning, um, the semantics, based on the statistical uh, nature of the uh, sentence, okay? So there are lots of different uh, approaches to sentiment identification. I have listed two here. 
the simplest approach is shown on the left side, and then the uh, probably the most uh, complex ap approach around is uh, shown on the right side, and you could have anything in between. Okay, so it it, it just depends on how sophisticated you want your system to be. Um, you can have as many uh, models and processes uh, in your pipeline as you want. Uh, the simplest model here uh, shows you how you could take product reviews and uh, identify sentiment polarity. Okay, is it a positive review or a negative review? So if you can, you know, if you think about all the Amazon reviews of uh, different products, people give a numerical rating from one to five stars, and they also have um, a summary text. So now uh, you can pick all the texts that are associated with five stars, call that positive uh, review, all the texts associated with one star, and call that negative uh, review, and then just build a classifier. <clears throat> And the process is exactly what you would expect from, you know, what you studied in the first three or four weeks. Um, you know, it's going to be a simple uh, NLP model where you <clears throat> first identify the sentiment. And that is, uh, you know, the, the data, if you are using Amazon reviews, the uh, labels come with the data set. Okay, so you don't have to annotate uh, the text and say, okay, this is a negative, this is negative sentiment, this is positive, this is neutral, etc. Okay, you can just use the ratings as a label for uh, the text. And uh, of course, you got to do your feature selection. You could do, you know, tokenizing. You could do, or you know, sentence boundary. You could do tokenizing, uh, part of speech tagging and lemmatization, stemming, and things like that. Um, uh, I'm sure you are already aware of some of these things. And then at the end, you have the sentiment polarity classifier. Okay, so that's the simplest, uh, simple process. So let me just, uh, in case you have forgotten, let me quickly go over these different boxes you see on the right side. Uh, sentence boundary disambiguation is just exactly what it says, it extracts different sentences. So if you put a long paragraph in your data frame and you do a flat map, this result should be uh, individual sentences, uh, you know, uh, individual sentences that are separated by a comma. Uh, part of speech, of course, you want to tag every word in each sentence as either a noun or a verb or an adjective or an adverb and you know uh, pronouns etc and those can be very this in some situations those can be very useful information for the classifier okay so if you're, per, you're trying to identify a particular entity uh, that is a noun then having an adjective in front of it you know increases the likelihood that this particular word is a noun okay and having an Adverb reduces the probability of the current word being unknown. So those are going to add more information to the model, okay? And lemmatization and stemming, uh, again, you want to have a basic ground uh, representation for each word. For example, eat, ate, eaten, eating should all be reduced to uh, one basic form. Um, let's say yeast, okay? So that's what limitization and stemming do. And once you have done all that, you have, you you know, you uh, extract uh, statistical parameters, metrics from the uh, whole document class, okay? So that's what uh, your tutorial is all about. You're gonna load up all the tweets and you're gonna clean them up initially, uh, remove, uh, punctuations, uh, remove, um, you know, all kinds of uh, weird symbols that we use, characters we use like hash, um, you know, uh, and um, then you tokenize, 
what is remaining and then you remove all these top words which are like you know a uh, the and and you know um so because they don't add any meaning okay now this is what i meant when i said our approach is going to be uh the extraction of meaning from using statistics we do not care about the grammar or grammatical correctness of a sentence okay okay so that's the general approach to um, sentiment identification now you may be wondering how you know uh, this statistical approach works at all okay as i said we are completely ignoring grammar but no you know no two human beings will ever make sense to each other if they only you know um speak um words that have you know and they have completely stripped out all the punctuations and all these top words from each sentence that they are saying okay it will not make normal sense to normal human beings right and yet it is that residual bag of words that are used to build classifiers for sentiment analysis we are claiming that we can extract the emotion behind a statement by simply looking at this residual set of words without the punctuation you know without capitalization without uh, you know without all the stop words and by reducing every word to its stem okay now why is that why is that even possible how is that even possible and, and you know, nobody really knows but one thing we know for sure is that almost all human languages obey something called the zips law zips law and <clears throat> so let's say you let's say you take uh, a long shakespeare drama or something like that and you look at the most frequently occurring word okay and it occurs with some frequency let us say f now you look at the second most frequently occurring word okay it will almost always occur at a frequency of f over 2 okay if you look at the third most frequently occurring word its frequency will be f over 3 okay so the nth most frequently occurring word in any language will occur at 1 over n time the frequency of the most frequently occurring word in that language okay now this is a statistical law the fact that we call it a law says that we don't understand how, why it is true okay but there are some statistical regularities uh, to uh, most human languages i have listed some here of course english is one of them and um, <clears throat> and you can see that they all obey zips law here the axis are log the you know so it's an it's a log log plot so it looks like a straight curve but it is actually 1 over n so it will be a you know 1 over n curve all right so that there is something going on here that we don't understand but we are exploiting this fact okay so here is one method uh, the first method of doing semantic analysis it's called latent semantic analysis uh, you will be encountering uh, parts of this in your tutorial okay so i have shown the term document frequency matrix um which will be generated uh, when you plot certain things in the tutorial so every column is a tweet or a document and every row is a term okay so for example the term flight occurs in the first document once it does not occur in the second third fourth documents okay 
the term unit occurs in the first document, second, and the third. And in fact, it occurs in almost all the 22 documents we see here. Okay, so now this matrix that plots documents as columns and terms as rows is a, um, you know, it's, it's almost a standard structure that is going to occur in a lot of NLP analysis, okay? Now, the quantity that is actually filled in can change. It can be a simple frequency, it could be a count, or it could be something more sophisticated. And I will show you some more sophisticated metrics later on, okay? But this is the basis of designing any uh, sentiment classifier. Okay, our polarity classifier. So you take this matrix, you fill it in with frequencies or some version of frequencies, and what latent semantic analysis does is do a dimension reduction along the, um, I should say, the y-axis or the rows. So it simply takes this and uh, reduces the number of rows without losing much information. Okay. In other words, uh, okay, uh, it, what, it, what it does is it finds synonyms, similar words, or words that occur together very frequently, words that are highly correlated. And then it comes, for example, car, truck, flower. Okay, you, if there, there are, those are three distinct words. There are three distinct rows. And they can all be combined into a single row using this equation because there is a high level of correlation. You will re realize that this is just a dimension reduction technique, okay? And there are a number of dimension reduction techniques like principal component analysis, singular value decomposition. So you can use any of those dimension uh, reduction methods to take this matrix and reduce the number of rows. Okay, so that you have you know, fewer computations to do. Okay, and uh, the idea behind, um, you know, dimension reduction is very simple. You take, uh, let's assume D is the main matrix, the complete document frequency matrix you have. And you are trying to find an estimate for D, which is D hat, and this norm, which is a Frobenius norm, is simply the root mean squared, okay, or root sum squared of the difference terms. So all you are trying to do is, you know, find a matrix that is very similar to the original matrix, but has fewer rows, okay, and applying by, and you are trying to minimize this uh, Frobenius norm, which is the root sum squared of the differences. And when you do that, you know, one way to do it is to use singular value decomposition. You have D equals U sigma V transpose. And, um, you know, sigma is a diagonal matrix. And then you, you can factor U and V into sub-matrices like this. And you can pick just one part of U and one part of V and one part of sigma and you have your reduced dimension matrix. So this is what you work with, okay? As you can, I think some of you already uh, encountered this problem today. When you are trying to view the document term frequency matrix, it took a long time because, you know, that's a lot of data, okay? What this technique does is without losing information, it shrinks that matrix, okay? And um, that's all there is to latent semantic analysis. Okay, so instead of just filling in the term frequency, you can also fill in the TF IDF. That's the term frequency and inverse document frequency. Okay, so think about this. Uh, let's say you have a term that is uh, that occurs with almost the same frequency in all the documents, does it provide any information at all for the classifier you're trying to build? No, okay? So 
they say this, this is a high frequency word if you only use the term frequency that is going to uh, influence your classifier because it's a high value right now but it is occurring in almost all the documents so it cannot be really adding much value to your uh, classification classification problem so what we do in tfidf is you take the inverse of the document frequency okay which is how many documents have this word okay if a lot of documents have this word then you are going to weight that frequency down weight the term frequency down okay so for example let's say here you see the word unit okay it occurs with a frequency of 1 and almost all the documents it's not going to add any value to the classifier to the classification problem so now if all the 100000 documents have uh, this word unit then you will not be entering one in those cells you will be entering one over 100000 so you are weighting down that value okay uh, on the other hand if a word okay if a term frequency um, is very small. In other words, the, uh, the frequency of, of occurrence of a particular term is small across uh, the whole corpus, okay? But at the same time, it also occurs in very few documents, okay? So you have to weight that frequency up a little bit because um, you know, it is not indiscriminately occurring in all the documents. It is very specific to certain documents. So that is what is happening here. And, uh, you know, because of all this uh, statistical uh, laws I explained, you know, slightly, you know, earlier, uh, the, we have a log function. So T, F, I, comma, J is the term frequency of uh, the ith term in the jth document and dfi is the document frequency of the ith term in other words how many documents actually have uh, that uh, that term okay and this matrix should be populated then with wij and you know you have a more sophisticated representation for the uh, matrix and now you just use this to do anything you want you know and, um, you know, you've seen um, a lot of uh, pipelines before. Um, all you have to do, you know, after you have gone through all these um, steps, is just build your own pipeline to do uh, polarity identification. Like, I put together some examples. There is an example with more than one layer of nesting. Well, here, this example is what I showed you, right? Table metadata. Okay, so let's go back here. I did a sub-query here, all right? So here is a table metadata example, and this is a sub-query in a sub-query, okay? So here, this is what I'm doing. I'm counting the number of tweets per location, see this, this little thing? Then I'm taking an average number of tweets per location. Uh, and then here, I'm listing the twist location with the more than average number of tweets per location, okay? Here, I cannot do what I just did there. What I did in here, I only have one nested subquery. It's because I'm looking at the overall average, right? If this is a whole table average. In there, I want to see, I want to look at it by location. See this? So what I'm doing is that I'm taking the number of tweets at each location and I'm taking the average. And then I'm using this inside of the main query. So just for you, I want to remember that uh, you can have several levels. And see this? This is a sub-query in the from close. So it's like a little virtual table, I would say, right? But if there is sub-query that you're using a lot, sometimes you may want to create a view. It's another database object. Sometimes you may want to create a view. If there is a little sub-query that you're using at all times, 
you can create a, like a virtual table, temporary table, or view, whatever you call it, view, right? Anyhow, uh, now, here, this is some, the, this is a troubleshooting, not a valid SQL error, and what you need to do is, you will receive the error if your column is misspelled, right? Like, like this is an example, city, I spelled it as city. So you have to correct the table name, the, the table names and the, and the column names. See, this, this is an example uh, of an error that you will see, and then you can click on details to do more readings if you'd like about the error. Uh, now here, this is basically some questions from the last semester. The query output is limited to 1,000 rows. How do I know how many rows my query returned? See this? This is an answer. You could do a subquery. Select count star. Count star returns the number of return rows. And then here you put your main query inside. Okay? This will tell you how many rows the query actually returns. Okay? Now in here, is it possible to increase the limit? Yes. And I'll show you this. Well, this was a common question that students asked. That's why I'm doing it. See this? I go here, and I can see here I can change the maximum number of rows. But keep in mind, you cannot go above 10,000. There is a top limit, there is a cap. Okay, you cannot go above that number. But yes, you can tweak a little bit. And this is a statement, end of statement indicator. And here, when you run all queries, it tells you what you should do, what, what it can do if there is an error message, if there is a problem. Okay, now. So this is the SQL part. Next thing is the R part. This is the fun part that we're going to go through. Uh, for the R Studio, there is a several ways you can access it. You can go to the Analyze tab here and click Launch DSX. Well, DSX is a form of data science experience, which is also called now IBM Watson Studio. Then you can log in and you can access R Studio from the tool menu. Now, here is another danger zone. I don't want to have it open in more than one tab, right? I already have it open in another tab. So let's close this and let's go back. I have it open already. And uh, this is my script here. And I'm going to do multiple things today. I'm going to show you something that's not, that's not in the walkthrough. So here are familiar windows, right? Environment, the history. Okay, so this is a lot of similar uh, to your regular R Studio. When you uh, first time log in, when you log in for the first time, you won't see the user library section. You will see the system library. Very important: do not install anything that you're not using. So when you uh, install the packages that you have to use, it's going to look like this. See this? I have only six packages in here. This is what you should have. And in fact. NPL and SLAM get installed when you install the TM. This get installed with it. But do you remember this. If you do the R dot version, it will tell you the latest version, right? Here it is. Let's see. This is 3.43, which is almost the latest. The latest is 3.44. So this is almost the latest R version, which is excellent. Now, uh, what you'll need to do is you'll have to install this package, IBM DBR. Uh, you install this, you install this only once, but on your next login, you would have to, you may have to run this library command because you want to put this package in memory. Ignore this line for right now. Okay. Here it is. So you, you want to load this library. See this? Because that's the library that you have to use to uh, read the data from your database tables, right? So here, this is how you approach it. Do you remember the database credentials? They are in this tab. Here it is. So uh, the way I did it, I click on this, and it would copy everything to the clipboard. And then I would go to the TextPad editor, and I would paste the whole thing. but for your code, only thing you need is this one, username, and you need the cost, and you need the password, which is at the bottom. This is the information that you need. 
in order to connect to the database. And this piece here I already added because it's going to be the same for everyone. Hopefully it stays the same. Anyhow, uh, if it changes, then you'll need to go and edit the code. So let's go ahead and run this. Well, my package is already in memory because I ran something before before this session. Okay, so now, see that this is the driver, all of this, this is the variable definitions. I have to run this thing. And basically what I'm doing here, I'm defining my uh, connection object. This is a connection, right? And now I'm going to connect to the database, right? And I'm actually going to show you more. It's in another script. This one, this is your walkthrough script, but I have some additional stuff added to it. So, now, uh, this is either, either query. That command you use, it allows you running the select statements, right? And this is going to store data in a sentiment data frame. That's what you did for your assignment, right? Run. Okay, it read the data. Uh, sometimes it's highly possible that I may not remember the table name correctly. Well, not a problem. This table. This command idea show tables, it's going to list all tables that I have in my schema. In my case, I have five now, right? And uh, this is the schema name, which is your username, owner. Well, in this case, don't worry, you own your tables. Uh, but in general, this is different. Because some in some databases, I can create a table and grant you access. Well, not here, not in this environment, but in general. Okay, I saw the question. Let's see, uh, would the R code also run in our studio on your laptop? Excellent question, Ed. In order for this to run in your laptop, you would have to install some drivers. <laughs> no, no, no. But another problem is you're using, you're losing the whole essence of working on a base on a cloud in memory database. Okay, so no, 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 don't do that. It might run, but you have to install some drivers and you're using the advantage of working on the cloud. Just remember that, okay? Uh, semesters ago, we were actually, the application had a reader where we used to actually read data from the reader, and it was reading into several tables, and then it was fun because I could ask students to do the table joins, right? You know that I'm fond of SQL. Anyway, now here, suppose that I have a long, well, I hope I answered this question. But now look at this. Suppose that I have a very long list of tables, <laughs> very long. And um, I'm not sure how my table is spelled, but I know that it contains the thing air in it. So I can just run this, and it will show me the tables that contain the string air. air. And here, this is just to check if my table exists, right? Uh, now here I have to give you, I may have to give you this query. Uh, do you remember the queries that I just ran in the SQL to check my tables programmatically? I can do it here, too. Well, in here, when I ran the query up here, I set it to the... I, I ran it at the query, and I set it to the data frame. Instead, I can do this. I can just do this. This will output the results to the console window. So this is what I can do that. And this is essentially almost the same information that we just ran in a DB2 warehouse in the cloud. And this is another one. Okay. I wanted to make sure that you guys see this. Well, it's wrapping up because it does not fit. So I would have to do this. I would have to move this. And then uh, click on that. I can click on the up arrow to rerun the last command. There we go. So now this is showing me the same information. But here in the where clause, I want to restrict it to the table name. And of course, table creator, that's going to be me, right? So table owner is not the same as a table creator. In this case, it is. But for example, uh, in another environment, Linux, he could have he, he could grant me access to 
keys table, right? If the permission allowed, not in here, but in general, perhaps if Linish grants me an access uh, to his table, then he is going to be the tab table uh, creator, and I'm going to be the actual user who is querying the table, right? It, 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 it's different. Okay? So just remember, this is in database environment, this is not the same. Okay? Anyways, so here are your table name, and you have the table creator and the, the column. And here it tells you if the column may have the empty values, and here is length, the number of characters in a column. Now remember, this is a worker, right? So it means that uh, if the column, if the value is actually five characters long, it will only occupy the space for the five characters, rather than 27. If it was a character, it would occupy the whole 27, no matter what, okay? So, anyways, uh, this is how you can run the queries. This is number of tweets for airline uh, sentiment, and you could actually take the you can you can take the queries that we ran today and run it here just to practice. So now there is something else that is not in your walkthrough. Uh, airline the trends, because if you look at your assignment four, you have an option. You can choose several between several methods. You have done the network of terms, right? It's in the walkthrough. You have done the word clouds. You have done the clustering in assignment two, but this is something that you have not seen yet. The trend analysis, and I'll give you this code. So the question here is, I want to look at how many posts, how my posts vary by day. When are my customers are more likely to complain about the airline? And uh, what are the most common complaints and when? So here, this is what I'm doing for right now. Here, I'm reading all data into sentiment data frame. Right, it's just going to read all. Okay. So I created the data frame. I call it sentiment and I read all data. Now what I have to do is I have a column called date created. And currently, that column is, is stored as the text, right? So let's go ahead and look. And here, see this, you can toggle between the uh, grid view and the list view. Well, you can run the str command to display the variable types. Or you can also check it here. Well, I prefer doing it programmatically, but... If, it, if you take a look at this, uh, the created, it's a character, see this? I have to, I must convert it to the date, and this is a formatting, right? Month, day, year, all right? So this is what I did right now. Uh, now I can calculate the number of posts per day. So see, so this is what I did, look. I created the field called post. I created a variable called post. And the post variable stores the date in a date format. I didn't actually convert convert in the actual source. This is what I did. And now I'm going to build this as a table. I'm going to show you the counts. This is the number of posts per date, right? My next question is to find the date with the maximum on number of posts. So here's the table, right? Table post, this is what it returns. And then which max command, this piece right here, it's going to return me the position of the date with the maximum number of posts. Remember, this is a list, right? Or this is a table, rather. See this? This is going to give me the position. Number seven, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. See this? This one right here. This guy. This is a date with the maximum number of posts. And this one, it will show me this. It will show me only the date is the maximum number of posts and the maximum number of posts. Aha, uh -huh. very, very simple, right? Okay, now let's do something more complicated. Uh, I can look at the, here is again, 
variable pause and I can do the plot. Uh, I might be interested in a uh, number of uh, posts per day, right? This is just the total number of posts per day. I can convert this as date and then I'm just going to do plot. And the plot is going to do the frequency count. Well, this is hard to read, right? Um, I would rather do the line plot and just line. That's it, right? Uh, that, it doesn't really help me much. Mm, not really. I can en enhance it further. I can do the separate line uh, per sentiment, right? Can I do this? Yes, I can. So to do that, I, there is more than one way to do it. This is a hard way to do it, is to use the Diplor package. This is a package. Now let's uncomment this. This package is already installed. What you have to do is you just have to load it in memory. Right? You have to load it in memory. And of course, you always say when you make changes. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run it now. And it's going to show me the number of posts per sentiment. Again, I'm reading my here. I'm reading my uh, data frame. And I'm going to call it DRS. I just call it this way. I'm going to run this line of code. So this is reading the data, right? Here, I'm just converting tweet created to the date, right? Nothing fancy. Here, what I'm going to do is, this is going to, this is using the summarize function in the deep core package. And what it's, it, it's calculating the number of uh, posts per day. This is a count, right? It's going to do the number of posts by airline sentiment by date. Okay? So this should return me the number of posts per sentiment per day. Right? I'm going to do this. And then if I do this one right here, if I do this, right, just to see what's going on. This is a list like this, right? This is what this returns, right? I have the sentiment, and I have the date, and I have the count. So now here I'm using the ggplot package. This is advanced way. And I'm going to do the color. See this? Each line, I'm grouping it by the airline sentiment, and the color is a sentiment. And I want to have the tweet created for the x-axis. And this is the data that I'm using. So this is a little bit advanced ggplot package, package, right? Okay, so I'm going to just do this and do this. And now, see this? Airline, okay, and here is per day. So here I can run analysis. I can tell when uh, I had more negative plots than positive, right? I can just look at the timing. Uh, when I had the most posts, when I had more, po more po mostly posts were negative, mostly positive, and then I can even drill down further, and I can look at my uh, by airline, right? So this piece on here, it will do by airline, and it will look only at the negative tweet, right? So what I'm doing here, I'm running another SQL statement. Uh, it will create daily sentiment by airline and here I'm doing almost the same thing I have to convert it to date and then I'm going to do the I'm going to generate the table that look to similar to what I just showed you but it's going to do breakdown by airline and this is a plot by airline but I'm only looking at the negative post right I have several options here. I could take a subset of data that I already loaded, right? Assuming that I loaded the field that I needed, but which I did not, right? Uh, or I just ran a brand new query. Look at this. I'm only selecting the field that I need just to conserve the memory. And also, you'll be running the query. You'll be uh, generating a bunch of data frames. Remember, you have your friend is RM command. You want to delete anything that you not no longer use, because 
look at this. If I swap this to the grid view, I can see how much space my data frames take. And I can even order this by the space. And then, see this? This is a problem. It can become a problem, right? And your matrix M is going to take the most space. I deleted it. And I deleted it because it was really huge. I don't need it right now. So I can just run rm command to delete what I don't need to save the space because I've had students who got up to 100 in here. Okay? So I'm going to give you this code. There are more examples. But since the time is getting late, we have to start wrapping up. So I summarized it for you. And these are the packages that you would use. They are pre-installed. You don't need to install them again. These are the steps, right? The credentials part, right? I just want, decided to repeat it again for you. And we just did this. These are your friends, right? You can check the table data programmatically from R. And this is what I just showed you. I just put this in a slide. So that way you have something for your reference, right? So this is about, this is how to troubleshoot. Uh, suppose that you get an error message. Uh, you want to check, suppose that this did not return anything, right? You want to check the syntax of your query in here. Uh, if something is wrong, take this query, copy and paste to the SQL editor, and troubleshoot the query. First, you want to make sure that your query works. And then you take it to R, okay? So that's the thing. You can run it within R, but you also want to make sure that your query is working, that you for sure know the table names and everything like that, right? Here, I just put a summary of what you can do. The time analysis, right? This is what we just did. And this is troubleshooting. Some of you already received this error, so you want to make sure that if you already have 10 services, you have to delete one. And this is, you get this error if your session timeout. This is done for security reason, and I'm not quite sure what the setting is uh, on the DB2 warehouse on the cloud, but a lot of government databases have a setting to 15 minutes. A lot of federal government have a setting for security in 15 minutes. So if you took your lunch break, you have to log in again when you come back. Okay? Oh, another thing is that do not enter your credit card number, okay? Do not enter your credit card number. Remember that when you have about two weeks left, or maybe even one month left on your account, you get another promo code, and you have to apply the code before the current code expires to stay out of trouble. And the trouble is, as soon as your account is expired, it's harder to add the code to expired account. We just went through it with one of your schoolmates. I'm, I'm not going to say names, but we just went through a lot of uh, difficulties because the deadline to enter the code was missed. Okay? So let me see the question from Ed. Okay. I'm going to read the questions. I would be interested in the drivers you mentioned that would be required to run, run locally. Okay. Well, the drivers, I have not tested it myself, but it's, it's, it's somewhere in a, it's not in here, but it's in a, there is a page called download. There is a page called download. Okay. It's not in here, but there is a page. It's called download. Okay, trust me, it's somewhere in here. Oh, I was, it was hidden with this. So somewhere there is a page, it's called the download. Okay? And that's where you get it. It might be, there might be a link on the main page. Oh, see this? I just reproduced the error. You would have to click on the sign in. It's because I did not do anything in this interface for some time. And if that happens, then you're going to be, you have to log back in. But yes, there should be a link somewhere here that you would need to download. After class, aha, uh -huh. you want to run analysis after class. So let me tell you that your account is still active. 
you you have the subscription for six months, and then you can get more. You can get more by entering another code because your student account, your student email account is still active. As long as your student account is still active, you can get another code. But very important, get the code two weeks before it expires. And a lot of your schoolmates they use the, the this they use uh, this applications in their capstone course. So, I strongly recommend that you guys get another code. Why not? You get another code. Oh, here it is. Look at this. I click here, and you select Downloads. That's where that would be. Somewhere in here, okay? Somewhere in here, there are drivers that you would need to get. I have not tested it, okay? But it's in this page. But... That I think, please don't do it for this assignment. Please don't do it. Uh, okay? If you do it, we are very good at catching it. It loses the whole essence of the assignment. But uh, the thing is, if your account becomes inactive, then you won't be able to access the service. So that's the thing. Once your account becomes inactive, you won't be able to access anything. So you want to keep your account active by applying another promo code, right? Before the current code expires, you would go to the uh, IBM Cloud and you just do, you just apply the code. See this? You go to Manage Billing, and on the billing page, you would need to apply next code. You follow the same instructions that you did when the course started to get the code, and then you just do this. You go in here, all right, and you click on apply code and enter the code. That's it. Yes, you can see that. I, you see this, you can see that. Every year I have to go in and do apply because the faculty account is one year and the student account is half a year. So you go to your account and apply because once you enter the credit card, the credit card, no good. You can no longer go back, go back to trial. So this is important. Do not enter your credit card, okay? This is a danger zone. No, 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 okay? Promise me you're going to remember, and you're going to keep your account active. All you need is your uh, student ID to obtain, your student email to obtain the promo code. You are still a student. You're taking data 670. That's student. It's capstone course, right? For as long as your email is active, you should be able to get the code, right? Well, faculty is a little different process, but for the student, you use the student email, and you got another half a year. Why not? Okay. Uh, you you have your demo, what's that? Both in R and SQL. Which one we need to use for the assignment? Okay, the question is, uh, I showed SQL and I showed R. Which one you need for the assignment? You have to use both. You have to use both. Oh, what? You asked, Ed, you asked if you lose your student email after the capstone course? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. The question is if you use your student email after the capstone course. Uh, Linish, may I ask you, do you still have access to your student email? Linish? Yeah, Linish? Um, yeah do, I do, do have access to student email. Okay, yes, so you do. Okay. Because I did not know, I did not have a question to, I'm sorry, I did not have an answer to for how long the student account stay active, but I think you do. You still have active, but I was not sure for how long, but I'm trying to remember because Lanish, you took data 650 in 2016, right? Uh, 2015. 15, 15, yes, because you were in the second group of students, so you graduated in 2016, and you still have access. It has been about, what, two years? Two years? Yeah, two years. Yes. So, <laughs> I had to ask Linus because, well, because at the time when I was student, we did not have a student email. At the time when I was student, it was about 10 years ago, we did not have a student email account like this. So I never had one. But, so that's the reason I had to ask Linus this question. So you're going to happen while well, you have you have to, you, you can activate it every upper year. You get a new code and use it. Why not? That's it. You just implies a code. 
Yeah, but but yes, your student email is still active. Okay. Yes, and yes, Mohammed, you have to use both. And if you read the assignment tutorial, explicitly tells you we use both, and the assignment you have to use both. I want to make sure that you know how to use both. Okay. And yes, sometimes if your SQL within R does not work, you want to make sure it's a working SQL. You you have to go to the database. Okay, I'm glad I answered the question. Do we have more questions? It has been a long session, but it pays back in the end. So, yeah, I'll give you a list of what not to do. Because, yeah, sure, you're the most welcome, Leo. But, I mean, people who said that this was the hardest assignment in the program, I think some of them made it hard for themselves by waiting until the last minute, by doing something on the list of what not to do. Okay? So, I like to show what not to do. That's me. Okay, so let's see what else. More questions? More questions? Going once, going twice. Oh, yes, is there is anything that you want to add or gap with you? Any um, no, I think you covered it all from just what not to do. Um, I, I don't know if you covered that as well, but I, in between you did allude to it, but um, about um, not using any other credentials but your own. So just make sure you're not just kind of typing or reading from the from the Word document, but uh, using your own credentials. So I know there was one or two students who kind of used the credentials from the from the Word document, and somehow it did run, or there was some confusion about did it run or not run. But in any case, you don't want to use the credentials from the from the uh, instructions. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> well, I try to delete it, but it's really hard because well, it's a lot of things involved. It's, really it's just a snapshot. It's just a snapshot yes. of you kind of going over it. But um, someone else, and, and also the day, the schema name would also be different. So do not be surprised if the schema name is different than what you know, you went through and showed to everyone today or what's in the instructions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Well. But otherwise, everything's covered. Thanks, Elena. This was a great session. Sure. And uh, go over to anything to add? <laughs> anything that people should not be doing or should be doing? Anything? Gopachi? Anything else? Well, if you don't have any more no, questions. I think I was on mute. Sure, two, two pages. Yeah, no, I, I said I, I don't have anything to, anything to add. Um, I think you have covered everything. Um, I just hope people get started early, that's all. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. And yeah, I'm going to keep an eye on the maintenance if there is any, but we'll see. Hopefully not. <laughs> there is one scheduled after after the class ends, because there, yeah. But but I'm not even well. I'll I'll, I'll keep checking and I'll let you know if there is in, if there are any outages planned within the next two weeks. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, Elena. Sure. So thanks, I'm gonna uh, stop okay, sharing. Thank you. And I'm going to stop the recording.